Welcome to this 17th and, at least for the time being, final episode in IBFD's Tax Take series of short videos on the global tax implications of the COVID-19 crisis. Technology has been a constantly recurring theme in the 16 uh, episodes that we've had so far, partly because of its role in the crisis and also for its perceived benefits coming out of the crisis. So it seems fitting that we finish up the series with a video that looks at the cutting edge of technology, ICT for short, and what that may mean for taxpayers and tax administrations going forward. Now, in this episode, we've invited three experts in the field, all from the Inter-American Center of Tax Administrations, CAT for short, which has been playing a leading role in this space. First up, I'd like to welcome Marcio Verdi, who is the Executive Secretary at CAT, uh, as well as being an economist and tax auditor uh, with the Brazilian Tax Administration. Uh, and he's joining us today from CIS headquarters. Well, I'm sorry, he's just from his home in oh. Panama, which is also the home of CIAT's uh, headquarters. So, Marcio, um, you and your colleagues are on a mission. Can you tell us what you're trying to achieve and how you're going to do that? Well, uh, to answer this question, I would like to say that in Latin America and Caribbean, as well as other countries and regions, of course, we have many challenges to be overcome by our tax administration. If we squeeze these problems, maybe the answer will be the need to improve the use of IT, information technology. Why? Because it allows uh, to, to, to increase the productivity and efficiency in all areas. To improve the quality of the use of IT is not an easy task to solve. It's very complex, it's difficult because it requires not only budgetary resource for investments in hardware and software, but, and the most important, to training people. And this is complex, because many administrations, they have neither the scale nor the size to have an information technology department. So, and the conclusion is, unfortunately, there is a huge difference in terms of knowledge in the use of IT, and the gap is getting bigger and bigger. So there's so, a technology gap. I think that's that really what you're saying. Gap, a knowledge gap to it. Yeah. Knowledge. And, and, and what's the magic silver bullet that you have come up with to solve that? Well, for me, the only way that we can jump to another stage of knowledge, cheaper and faster, is the technical assistance. So for me, the only solution is to increase the cooperation, the international cooperation and the training of human resource. Right. So, and in concrete terms, what 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 has SIAT produced uh, that's going to help that process? Well, you know, we have a, a long and a great experience in doing technical assistance, but we decide to produce a, a book, a, a, a public good, in order to offer to any country like a guideline, we try to put inside the what we have done, the past experience, what the stage we are right now, and the, looking for the future. Uh, the idea of SIAT, as we know, that is difficult to find. You can go to the best university in the world, but it's very difficult to study the use of IT for the tax administration. So the book is, the idea is to have like a, a Bible that for the use of IT. Great. Uh, well, I mean, th this, that, that, that sounds like it's, you know, a, a solution that every country should be looking at. Uh, and it is, as you said, it's free. It's freely available on the CIAT website. And the title is ICT as a strategic tool to leapfrog the efficiency of tax administrations. So um, I think it's a, it's a great uh, mission. And I think this is going to be a tremendously valuable resource uh, going forward. Now, Marcio, I know that that's not your only mission. Uh, there's one uh, other important mission that you've got on your agenda. What is that? 
Well, thank you very much for this question. Actually, we had a great meeting last December last year with the World Bank, IDB, OECD, and a few countries. And actually, we decided to collaborate with the countries related to digital economy, doing two things. OECD is leading the process to prepare a toolkit to, to give to the countries the legal mark that they will need to implement uh, the, the taxation on the digital economy. And we at SEAT, with the support of these organizations too, we are constructing an IT system, a very single one that uh, the idea is to be a public good uh, that any tax administration could uh, download and use. So we are working this. The idea is to have this system ready no longer than March of 2021. And I think we will be very important for many, many countries in the world. Right. Well, thanks very much, Marcia. And I'm sure that that will be in time for any new rules on taxation of the global um, uh, or taxation of the digital economy uh, as and when they come out. So thanks for giving us your insights thanks. on uh, what SEAT is doing. And now we're going to move on to uh, two of your colleagues uh, on the uh, on some of the more uh, uh, technical, concrete aspects of it. So thanks Thank very much. Very much. Uh, it was a pleasure for me. Eh? Thank you very much. Bye bye. I'd now like to extend a warm welcome to Raul Zambrano, his, who is one of the tax wizards who's worked on SEAT's uh, ICT book for tax administrations. Um, specifically, Raul is Director of uh, Technical Assistance and ICT uh, at SEAT, uh, working in Panama and also speaking from his home in Panama today. Raul, you're one of the authors of the chapter on disruptive technologies in the book. Uh, now, disruptive obviously has a slightly negative connotation. Uh, in, certainly in the COVID-19 crisis, we know how disruptive that's been. But you mean disruptive in a positive sense. How can these technologies actually help us? Thank you for having me. Uh, tax administration has uh, always used information technology to support their activities and for both uh, to support taxpayers and, and facilitate compliance and to enforce control. And uh, the current use of a uh, huge amount of information that come from immediate transactions, electronic invoice and so on, give, give the opportunity to use a lot of information in that process. And particularly the use of big data, advanced analytics and artificial intelligence has a potential. And I see that that's put, that potential could come in different flavors. The first one is to support service. So there are experiences using uh, digital assistance uh, to answer taxpayers' uh, questions. Uh, there is a very nice example in Spain in with the SII. Uh, system that uh, a chatbot is answering a lot of questions, uh, thousands, thousands of questions without the need of scalability. And that took in place a lot of information, even the tone of the conversation the taxpayer is, is giving us to understand when that conversation should go to an individual and to an actual person. That's very interesting. And I think it will be used uh, uh, in the future for other things within the interaction with taxpayers for, for collections and so on. The, right. the other aspect of artificial intelligence is to use that to, to uh, support uh, enforcement control. And that will use a lot of information to put together uh, to identify the probability of non-compliant situations, the networking in terms of who are you dealing with and, and, and understand the patterns of your behavior to uh, kind of predict uh, when a non-compliant situation is going to happen and maybe uh, facilitate action from the tax administration to uh, stop that. That's on the compliance side. What about the policy side? Can, can governments use these new disruptive technologies to help designing their rules? De definitely. In the future, uh, near future, I think, not immediate future, but in five, maybe ten years, uh, the, the Computation capabilities will be so that uh, using things like digital twins or something like that 
we, we will be able to simulate every agent in the economy uh, to understand their interactions, their consumption habits, and, and so on, and to simulate what would happen uh, under a particular circumstance, like a new tax reform, to if you move something up or down and see what, how it will impact individuals and the economy, or see, for instance, if another COVID-like situation uh, will happen, uh, who will be affected in what way in, in, to, to certain aspects. Uh, before actually doing that. So uh, that's a, a thing that I will see. It will we will see in the future. T talking of the future, um, as you say, uh, these are not necessarily technologies which are today fully in place um, and there are challenges to be overcome. What do you see as the main challenges? Well, the, the, the main challenge with using artificial intelligence within the tax administration, and it's not only tax administrations, the organizations, is that with uh, that uh, comes a lot of implications and risks. Uh, uh, ethics should be put in place. You have to avoid uh, uh, bringing your personal biases or the organizational biases in with the tax, uh, with the artificial intelligence into the tax administration. Uh, otherwise, you will end up with a very efficient uh, robot. Uh, but very biased robot, and, and that should be avoided and should be done with care. The other thing is when you see that the big picture is that we rely a lot in technology for uh, tax administration's uh, uh, job, uh, but, and, and we have designed things to avoid a single point of failure. That's right. But, but when we see that uh, a multiple point of failure where everything fails at the same time uh, in situations like this, uh, things will be uh, very different. We need to uh, to design things, considering not only that we do not need we need to avoid a single point of failure. We need to be prepared to many points failure in, uh, with uh, failing at the same time. So I guess well there are there are two things. Um, these technologies can help predict the future, but we also need ourselves to be prepared for what's coming and not rely 100% on this solution, we need to look at the big picture. I, th I think that's a great uh, uh, takeaway. It's a great way to, to leave the subject of disruptive technologies and drill down to a specific example of one of these technologies, and that is the e-invoicing uh, technology that we're going to look at in the next part of this episode. So thank you very much, Raul, for giving us the insights into disruptive technologies. Yeah, thank you, Ian, for having me. We've looked at the big picture, and now we're going to drill down to a concrete example of technology in practice, specifically e-invoicing. Now, many people are familiar with the idea of e-invoicing, but be warned, it's a lot more complicated than it might at first appear, as we will find out in a second, when we speak with Vinicius Pimentel de Freitas, uh, who's uh, joining us from Brazil, uh, another a tax um, wizard uh, at uh, SEAT, uh, but he's also a tax auditor at the state of Rio Grande do Sol in Brazil. Uh, it sounds like a wonderful place to work and live. Uh, and he's also coordinating the Brazilian electronic invoice program. So he's the ideal person, one of the leading uh, experts in the field in the world. Um, to talk to us about this. He's incidentally also just finishing a book, which I believe you're on page 700 at the moment. So that speaks for itself <laughs> how complex this area is. Um, but I would like to sort of start with a question, uh, and that is, if e-invoicing is uh, such a good idea, why isn't it more popular? Why hasn't it been picked up uh, and adopted in more countries across the world? Um, and in particular, why is it so popular in Latin America? You know, there is cultural difference among uh, continents and then more than that among countries. If you come here to Latin America, we think as the invoice, but invoices here is, are a uh, fiscal matter with commercial uses. If you go to Europe as in, in, in confrontation, uh, in Europe you have invoices as a commercial matter with fiscal uses. That's the biggest difference because here in Latin America, you have tax administrations impulsing the adoption, the broad adoption, the massive adoption of electronic invoices as a mandate. And if you go to, to Europe, 
uh, in the other side, you have for the not just cultural reasons, but also for the, the EU directives, you know, you don't have this kind of mandate to tax administration. So uh, that's why if you let people just for economic reasons, it's the, not what everybody thinks about because electronic invoices are cheaper, are easier and are better to use. But if it, what you really observe is most companies don't or choose not to adopt freely. That's one. And two, you have uh, so many different standards you can use. Is that not a, a major problem if you want to have e-invoicing for cross-border transactions? Yeah, uh, it, it, that's the biggest problem I say we have, we are facing right now because each and every country has uh, how to enforce national standards is, is what you observe here in Latin America, you observe in, in Turkey, in Italy, in Kazakhstan and <laughs> all over the world. But you don't have, you know, any stand, a, a standard, interna an international standard for that. And it has became, I think, even more expensive for this kind of company to use electronic invoices instead of paper voice invoices. Yeah. So, I mean, if, if that, that's kind of counterintuitive because, you know, everybody says, oh, yeah, it's cheaper, it's easier, it's quicker. Um, and then you're saying, no, actually, it's kind of more complicated. And I think that's the reason for that is it goes back to the, the point that e-invoicing is not just about sending a PDF of your invoice by email to your customer. Mm. It's much more complex than that. Can you tell us, can you give us just an, a feeling for where is e-invoicing going? We must think about that uh, in the beginning of the, the, the 21st century, you have, we have to let go some concepts that came from 500 centuries of paper using. And one of these concepts is document, and we have a second concept that is invoiced as a kind of document, and we have the third concept that's electronic invoice. But all of these concepts, think about the information about a transaction as static. And I think you have to deconstruct this concept. To de deconstruct the concept. Deconstruct yeah. and think about the information about a commercial transaction. And this information is dynamic for, for its uh, really nature. You, you have to have instruments to add information that come after the original transaction and it can it, it can came you know a day a week a month several months after that yeah. and all this different information may have different people with the right to access the information not every people has uh, ha have the right to access every information about the transaction I'm not talking about the invoice, but the transaction. And you don't have only commercial information. You have financial information. You have taxes information. You have security information. because It can be a sensitive cargo you're talking about. You have health information. We have to think in a structure that can be dynamically updated and dynamically accessed by whoever has the right to access each and every part of that, those information about an original transaction. Well, I think that pretty much says it all. Um, uh, Vinicius, I'd like to thank you for uh, the, having uh, given us the final word in this IBFD series of um, tax takes videos on the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the tax implications. Um, it's certainly not gonna be the final word on those tax implications, uh, uh, but uh, I, I would thank you for, for having taken us so far and given us a glimpse of the future. Uh, thank you also to our viewers for uh, their, um, uh, th their following us in these tax takes videos. Uh, if you'd like to see the whole series, then please take a look at our, um, our website uh, where you can see all 17 episodes. So thank you once again. Thank you, Vinicius.
And, and thank you for the opportunity to share what I think. Thank you very much.